Right, can I just say how wonderful it is to see how so many people here uh, this afternoon or this evening, whatever time it is. Uh, it's, it's great because, you know, we, we spend all summer coming together at festivals and then we have this long winter to get through and, uh, you know, we all go off to our own little separate little, you know, parts of the uh, globe. And for me down in Dorset, where I live, there's not an awful lot of people that share the sort of va values and views and ideas that I do. And so it's always lovely to come here to Glastonbury where there's as many nutters <laughs> like me. So uh, I think it's brilliant. So thank you everyone for coming along. And uh, let's hope that we can make this a regular event. I don't know if we're going to do it every week or every month or every two weeks. Every week. Every so every Sunday. So this is somewhere where you can escape and uh, bring the kids along and have some chocolate and whatever. So, uh, yeah, I just think it's uh, uh, you know, a wonderful opportunity to come together as a, as a community. So, uh, right, why I'm here and talking about money, uh, I'm not going to be doing, no, when I say like economics, it's not going to be sort of, I'm not going to be doing graphs and charts or anything complicated. Uh, I'm going to keep it really simple uh, because that's the way my brain works. But the reason why I'm talking about money, it's my background isn't in economics or banking or anything like that, far from it. Uh, what it was, I ended up in a fairly sort of uh, moderate amount of debt. You know, it was in tens of thousands. So, you know, I sort of went down quite spectacularly. I had a successful business, I sold it. And for one reason or another, I didn't get paid, and so I suddenly had VAT tax and everything that should have been paid off all come at once. So, but I'd already gone through some sort of, I don't know what it was, but I, I'd gone through some sort of shift in my life. And, and I'm sure, I can't really put into words what, what, you know, what happened, but my focus changed completely. And so suddenly I was in like thousands and thousands of pounds. So what? You know, okay, I, you know, go to the bank, bank machine, you won't give me any money. Okay, we'll have to think about that, you know, but, you know, I sort of like managed to get around it. So what it did, it, I, I, I thought, right, there's got to be like a spiritual solution for my debt problem. And it wasn't, uh, and this is why I'm now talking about spiritual economics, because I think everything we do has to be in alignment if not, it's not going to work. Does everyone agree with that? It's got to be, if, if, if you're not in alignment with anything you're doing in your life, there's going to be struggles, there's going to be obstacles in your way. Once you get into alignment, well, I'm sure we all know this, once you actually get into alignment with all that is, you know, if you go out on a limb, things get difficult. When you get back into alignment, things seem to flow, don't they? It's almost like the universe is guiding you in a particular direction. So the direction that I actually went in, was I came across this lady who wrote this amazing book and I've never actually spoken to her but we're in email contact and this is Mary Elizabeth Croft. She wrote this book whew, about over 10 years ago which is quite a long time in the sort of truth movement. She saw the whole picture way before lots of other people. Who's actually come across this lady? Yeah, so yeah, there's, there's a handful of you. This book is available free online. Uh, you can download it from our website. Her website is currently down at the moment, which is a bit of a shame. Uh, hopefully it'll be back up, but we did have links to her website. Uh, basically she wrote, how I clobbered every bureaucratic cash confiscatory agency known to man. And when I came across this, it's a long e-book and it's, it's pretty hard going as well. It's not easy. It, it's like, it, 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 it's pretty, it's, it's, I won't say it's an easy read, but it's quite amazing. It, it does something to your head and it shifts you like 180, 90, 180 degrees, however. And I suddenly thought, wow, there's a solution to my uh, debt problem. Because at the time, what she said, she said, basically, what you can do, get onto the bank, say, well, look, have we got a valid contract? And that mean, a contract means that two people have to sign. So if you ever got a you know, credit card agreement, you sign it, but I've spoken to bank managers since uh, finding out about this. And I say, do the banks ever actually sign any of their documents? I say, yeah, you get a photograph, a, a photocopied signature 
from the uh, head of finance uh, or head of lending or whatever photocopied signature, well that doesn't stand, shouldn't stand in a court of law. They get round these things, but it shouldn't stand. Because if I have a contract with you, sir, you know, it's like we could uh, right, both put our signature, our own you know, uh, autograph onto the piece of paper, which makes it a valid, it's just one of the uh, essential things. And the other thing is, of course, there's got to be what's called consideration. And that's something of value. Now the thing is, I'll be going on to this in a minute, but I believe that what they're giving us is created out of thin air. It's digital currency. And so they're getting us to work with our sweat equity, our actual physical, yeah, we're grafting quite hard, and then they're giving us these like electronic digits that they can create out of nothing. And the result of that is that every time we have a transaction, and that means that, you know, the last transaction I did was some uh, very lovely uh, organic chocolate over there, uh, which I paid in pounds, but unfortunately, every time we make a transaction using the current currency, it's like half of that is taken away. It's skimmed off in VAT, in uh, ridiculous fuel costs, and so we should be living in abundance. But what's happening is that everything just seems to be a little bit, a lot of us sort of like, is there anyone that's got more money than they need here? Anyone? No? Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I should put my hand up and say, you know, I, I'm a multi-millionaire. It's just that it doesn't come very quickly. It always just about comes in. You know, I never go actually hungry. And I always manage to put petrol in. You know, sometimes it's a little bit tight. But uh, it's like it always keeps flowing. Uh, and that's the way you can live. And abundance is so much more than just money. So you've got to think your health, your friends, community, it's far more. If you're caught up in the, the idea that abundance is just money, then you've been hoodwinked into this materialistic world, which, you know, you, you need to a little, perhaps do a little bit of deprogramming. So anyway, I digress. Uh, I thought, brilliant. I found a, 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 you know, I found a way of solving my economic woes. So what I did was, uh, I thought, fantastic. And she's talking about these, you know, these things you ask the bank, contract, you ask if, you know, wh where did they get the money from, basically, and there's a couple of other things that I can't even remember now. Uh, but anyway, I thought, brilliant. So what I did, this was about in 2007, so it was, what, seven years ago. And so what I did, I Googled, because we had Google back then, I Googled Mary Elizabeth Croft template letters. And you know, normally you get, like, you know, ten, you know, 100,000 of like results or nothing. Nobody had done, you know, her book was already sort of like making the rounds on the internet and there was no template letters. I can't, I can't believe nobody's actually done the template letters and actually somebody must have used them because what I did in the, in the time being, of course, is that, uh, well, I actually had to create the letters myself. So I read the book, it, it, I read the book three times and the last time I read it, I actually made notes. And I really sort of like got it into my head so that I sort of like could feel it and understand it at a, a, a deep level. And then I just created the letters and sent them off to debt collectors and the banks and it, it, or anyone that sent me a letter, I just send them these three letters, 10 days apart, bang. And something happened because up until that point, the debt collectors would phone me up. And I was sort of like, you know, just woken up, sort of like some sort of spiritual awakening had happened to me. So I was in my power, and then the debt collectors would phone me up, and suddenly my voice would go all, all sort of like wavy, and, and I'd get like really nervous, and my heart would start going. And I'd go, oh, uh, hello, and I'm thinking, hang on, something's going on here energetically. And I thought, what is it? And I had to sort of like pull the string backwards, and I was feeling guilt and shame. But the more I looked into the financial system, I realised that all the debts can't be paid off because there's not enough money in circulation to pay all the debts off. So it's obvious that people like us are going to end up, sooner or later, owing money to corporations that we can't pay back. And I'll explain why. I'll, I'll just, I think I've got, a, I've got some very useful, very useful bit of kit here. I've got a bag of marbles, which is the easiest way to explain why we can't pay off our debts. Okay, 
in my bag. So I will talk about spiritual economics. I'm just looking at what the problem is first. The biggest problem is I can't get my marbles out. Here we go. <laughs> right, I have two, four, six, eight. I've got ten marbles. That's brilliant. Uh, often, occasionally they go astray, but I've got ten marbles. Yeah, are you yeah, happy that I've got ten marbles in my hand? Right. I'll put them back in the bag. Right, have we any conjurers or magicians or magi or anyone here in this room that can get 11 marbles out? Nobody? Come on, there's 50 earth pounds if you can do it. Nobody. No? Okay, we'll accept that without slight of hand, without slipping an extra marble in, it's very difficult to get 10 out, sorry, 11 out if you've only got 10. Yeah? But every time you borrow money from a bank, that is what they expect you to do. They charge you interest on that money, also known as usury. Now that money isn't in circulation. It doesn't exist. So two things have to happen. One is the supply of money has to keep growing. It has to go up and up and up and up. Otherwise the whole thing would just collapse overnight. And the other thing is, People are always going to not pay their debts because that is how it is designed. It's nothing to do with you being unable to sort of like earn enough money. It's that somebody, it's like if we're playing musical chairs, there's hardly any chairs, there's about one or two chairs empty. So if we took those away and we all start playing some music, everyone gets up and boogies and then somebody, whilst we're all dancing, somebody actually takes two chairs away and then we all have to sit down and we're all scrabbling for chairs because there's two missing. Somebody's going to end up on the floor, aren't they? And that's exactly what the banking system does. It's creating a scarcity and lack which stops us living in abundance because we should be living in abundance. That's what I personally feel. You, you know, it's like we're creative beings. It's wonderful. But the way we have to... Uh, trade with each other, and the way we do trade with each other, we have to use these ridiculous things like plastic cards or you know, pe pieces of paper which are worth nothing. But those pieces of paper are actually, they're not actually, at one time they were promissory notes for gold, well actually in the UK it was actually silver, that's why we're sterling. And it was a, if, if I remember rightly, it was a Troy pound of silver, so it's actually a, it was based on a pound, a Troy pound, which is slightly different from the imperial measurement of silver. They took all the precious metals away from us, and we're left with worthless paper, which is actually created as debt. So it, it's debt, and the government has to borrow debt, has to borrow money from private banks. Well, the government should be able to create debt-free money and give it to us. It's crazy. It is crazy. And I believe it's just a way of controlling us and keeping us in lack. Because, you know, you know as soon as you go out, you're thinking, can I afford to go out? Can I put a picture in my car or whatever? And I tell you, the most scared people are uh, the ones with lots of money. Because I sometimes do talks and I explain that mathematically the system has to collapse. And the people that are most nervous about it are the people with like a few hundred thousand pounds in the bank. They're crapping themselves because they've worked really hard for a few years, and they've got this, like, this one thing that's like, keeping them safe. And if that goes, well, yeah, yeah, well yeah, anything could happen, can you see? So it, it's, like, it, it's, it's crazy. Anyway, what I did, uh, I used the letters, they worked really well. But as I say, initially I was like, really scared, but then something happened, because once I'd read the book and found out all this, something changed within me, because what would happen is the, uh, the debt collectors would phone up and I'd say, uh, I'd say, is John Whitrick there? I'd say, and the first thing I did was like, say, oh, just a minute. And what I do in the day to keep me calm, I listen to Radio 3, because it sort of like keeps my mental sort of like, sort of like, uh, it keeps me sort of grounded and it sort of like keeps me calm. So I say, just one moment. Uh, I wouldn't say he's not here. I'd just say one moment, because I didn't want to lie to him. So, I, and then I'd put the phone next to the speaker and give him a bit of Beethoven or something really calming, because I'm thinking, he's poor, poor guy, he's probably in a, a call centre, he's probably got about 50 calls to make an hour, let's calm him down, and, and give, him a bit of, yeah, give him a bit of love as well, yeah, so, so nice calming voice, just one moment, I'll say, yeah. 
the leader, and then I tiptoe away very quietly like that, you know. It was like, and that was the first time I started empowering myself to stand up to, because I was getting loads of phone calls. I was getting, you know, I had VAT, I had the uh, inland revenue, they're all after me, and I was like, oh God, what am I going to do? But this was the first thing I did to stand up. And then, of course, I started like being a little bit more creative because then I'd start really getting into my power. And they'd say, it's John Wittrick there. So, yeah, just one moment. Uh, you're calling me. Uh, I'd like to ask you a few security questions first, <laughs> if that's okay with you. And so what I'd do, I'd say, well, uh, can I have your mother's maiden name? Oh, God, I'd want their full name, direct telephone number, mobile number, and date of birth and all this, and, of course, mother's maiden name. And then I'd ask them... Uh, uh, and what's the capital of Cuba? That's, a, that's always a good one. <laughs> oh, you don't know? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, never mind. Uh, is there anything else I can help you with today? No? Okay. Uh, well, nice calling. Thanks. And I was back in my power. I wasn't afraid anymore. And that's really... When you realise what's going on, something changes. Uh, as soon as you, you're not scared, the debts go away. And that's what... Something really big happened to me, and it shifted me. And... So what I did, I put it together, I got online and I found this like little website template that was really simple and I put the letters up and uh, it was called Get Out of Debt Free and I put it up and this is now the fourth incarnation of it. It now looks like a proper grown up debt site but that's just to get lots of people into it. So people go on but it basically, uh, we've got a forum with over 60,000 members now and it's been really part of the sort of truth and sovereign freedom movement. Don't be fooled by the fact that it looks corporate. We're doing that for a reason, uh, because we want to get as many people in the funnel as possible. And then they get on the forum, they find out about alternative health, uh, free energy, the whole free man sovereign movement, uh, the whole lot, basically. They go down the rabbit hole. So there's a lot of people sharing really valuable information. And... Back in 2011, uh, yeah, it took a long time before anything sort of like happened. But back in 2011, I can remember my, the guy that does the code for the website, and uh, he looks after the servers and stuff like that. He phoned me up and said, something's going on. The server's almost crashed. We've just been whacked really hard. You know, we thought somebody might have been trying to take the site down. No, what had happened is a, debt a load of debt collectors had got together and got a meeting. And what they decided that there were certain websites, because this is a website that I put out, get out of debt free, they said there were certain websites that he wanted removed from the internet. Now, what happened was a Guardian reporter actually turned up and he actually did a story on it saying there's certain websites they want removed, but they didn't know how they're going to remove it. And fortunately, one of the websites you see down there at the bottom was get out of debt free. And so we suddenly get a hyperlink along with Consumer Action Group, Blagger, Penalty Charge Forum and Legal Beagles, four other websites. We suddenly get a link to the, well, I think the Guardian is the highest, that gets higher traffic than any other UK website. So we suddenly go, we're sort of languishing on page four of Google within hours we're on page well, within a day or so we're on page one of google because so many people started hitting us and then within a few days of that if you put in debt free get out of debt anything like that we were number one on google and that's where we've remained for the last well since 2000 and 2011 so what's that three years four years coming up to so purely because a lot of people are actually sort of waking up to this. It's almost like, and I must admit, when I, I put off doing a website, because I thought, oh, it's something I can do. And this little voice in my head was saying, no, do a website. And until I actually put the website up, I was getting this little voice in my head. So it's almost like it wasn't my idea. It was a little nagging voice that said, I've got to put a website up. And I'm not suggesting anyone goes out and does this, but this was spotted on Brighton Seafront Nothing to do with me. <laughs> I've no idea who did it. But this is really nice when people actually do that. Uh, that, you know, that, that feel really strongly about something. And it is a community website now. And so it's, it's like the members sort of like run it and rule it more than, more than I do. So I'm just fortunate that I was in a situation where I had to sort of like do something to sort my problem out. And I just followed my, I think I followed my heart or a little voice in my head. 
or one of the voices in my head at any rate. So, uh, but as George Carling said, just because the monkey, just because you got the monkey off your back, doesn't mean the circus has left town. So I've dealt with my sort of debt problems relative. Yeah, I don't get pursued by debt. Well, I haven't been for quite some time. It's nice when you know one of the debt collectors does uh, actually chase me because I miss I miss the uh, interaction with them. To be honest, because I really quite enjoy it. But uh, yeah, if, if if you could turn your mobile off, please, uh, Sean. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so as George Carling said, so we've actually got to find out what the problem is with money. And as I said before, it's every time that we make a transaction with each other and use sterling, then obviously there's, you know, every time I buy a beer, I have to pay, I think there's VAT on this, isn't there? And there's a huge amount, I think probably about that much goes to the pub and the rest of it is in duty, I believe. Is that about right? Well, yes, but John, we must tell the people that our last quarter, our VAT was 11,700 yeah, pounds. Yeah, yeah. And we've got nothing in the bank. Yeah. Batman has all our money. Yes, so, yes. You know, this is part of what we have to do this year in the round table. Totally, totally. Uh, yeah. I, I, I just want to ask a brief question. Did they actually get off your back very quickly? Yes. Because of the letters that you wrote them? Yes. Uh, but also the the debt collectors that carried on, I, I wasn't the slightest bit worried for some reason, and I've no idea why. But the VAT and HMRC, which are the only ones worth worrying about, to be honest, forget the rest, forget the banking. It wasn't secured; they can go whistle. Uh, and you know, I do miss the debt collectors uh, phoning me up because you can have a good laugh with them. But uh, once you get into the right mindset, but. I still think it was like really bizarre that as soon as I stopped worrying about it, the problem went away. It's almost like the universe is interactive and if you get into a right state of alignment, then your problems that you need, that the universe is testing you for. Now, the other thing happened is that a few years later, I actually got a job and it was P-A-Y-E, and I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm going to be back on the system, because I was off the system for quite some time. And, uh, and I can remember, I had to go along to the, you know, it, it's, it's Bournemouth, our, our nearest town, and I had to go along and say, they oh, say, you haven't got, a, you haven't got a, 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 a needed some sort of number, I didn't have it, because I hadn't been employed for years, I'd always been self-employed, so they said, right, you've got to go to the, so they said, oh, uh, it's coming up on our records. I'm thinking, oh shit! You know, it's like it's, it's going to come up that I owe 15k. Is it coming up on our records that we owe you some money? <laughs> I'm thinking, and say, and they said to you, uh, they said to us, uh, oh, you, you just drop us a line to say that. You, and I never did. I think they it came up on their computer. I owed them a couple of hundred. They owed me a couple of hundred quid. I thought, no, no, let's not push it. <laughs> I thought, I'm quite happy, just like, I'm up at the moment. But I'm not up, because, you know, when you realise what the, the, the money they take in tax is actually used to pay off the interest on the money which is created out of thin air, it's just crazy. So that's the problem, basically, with money. And normally, when I do my talk about money, uh, I talk about monopoly and I'd normally talk about the all the things in common with the game of monopoly with the global financial system and when you go through it all together do you know that just one thing but there's low it's almost like monopoly was created to explain well it was actually this is another thing uh, which I would cover in the other talk that I do about the sort of like the problem but this is more a solution based talk but one of the things is that the game of Monopoly wasn't created by some poor guy during the recession, which is what Waddington's would tell you. It was actually created by a university professor, uh, a, a female uh, lecturer in America, and she was trying to show why the current uh, capitalist system won't work. Because what happens is, as you get more money, more money comes to you and one person ends up with all the money. Now, has anyone won Monopoly before? Yeah. You've won, right. Do you realise that when you, you won, you bankrupted yourself? Because if you have all the money, you can't trade with anyone. 
unless you have to give them some money back so they can give money back to you. Can you see? This is the situation we're in at the moment because all the money is just going to the corporations. Somebody did a valuation on Rothschilds and they reckon they're worth 10 trillion. Just one banking family, 10 trillion. I think it could be more than that. I mean, it's so, why would anyone, you, you know, half a million pounds would sort me out for life. It really, well, perhaps it would, I don't know. <laughs> By the time we got the mansion swimming pool, I don't know. <laughs> no, we could, we could certainly get a good community together if any of us here had that sort of money. So, uh, yeah, Avalon Rising wouldn't be struggling for a budget anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, certainly. As I say, it would be... Yeah, let's all manifest it. Let's all manifest a community space where, uh, you know, where we've got somewhere dry and warm in the winter and, and this would be ideal. That's something we'll be talking about later. But it's crazy, you know. Uh, there we, you know, this is something I found, which was, you see the keyboard in front of you, type in one million pounds, congratulations, you've just created a million pounds. That's how banks do it. Seriously. Now, they say, oh, they've got to have reserves. We have to have reserves. The reserves are based on debt. They use debt as collateral for more lending. Now, I got, you know, um, and not only that, but they admit that they do it. Here we go. This chap here is Sir Mervyn King. He's the ex-governor of the Bank of England. And what he actually says is when banks extend loans, they call it loans. That's the other thing I say is that anyone here had a loan? No, nobody here has ever had a loan because they didn't have anything to loan you. They created it out of nothing. You can't loan something. I can't loan you my car if I haven't got a car, have I? Can I? I'd actually go and borrow a car or steal a car, but I can't loan you a car if I don't own it. So. You know, when they extend loans to their customers, they create money by crediting their customers' accounts. They create money. They tell us. That, 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 that it's like that they don't even hide the fact. Former Secretary of, the, Secretary of the British Treasury. Banks lend by creating credit. They create the main means of payment out of nothing. They, I was like, can you hear what he just said? You know, it's like... Wow, it's like, I get a Bill Hicks moment here. It's like, <laughs> look, look, they're lying to us. <laughs> and here we go. Uh, Graham Towers, Governor of the Bank of Canada. Uh, Canada. Every and each time a bank creates a loan, new bank credit is created. New deposits, brand new money. You know, it's, this isn't a secret. And this is one of my favourite. The financial crisis of 2007-2008 occurred because we failed to constrain the private financial system's creation of private credit. So what he's doing, he's blaming the financial crash on the system itself. The way they're creating too much money out of nothing. And this is the problem. You know, they say, oh, we've got a recession, we've got this, we've got that. And nobody actually says, well, if you had a 10-year-old child that was like quite bright, said, mummy, what's a recession? And mummy go, oh, well, it's me. But if you actually ask, it's down to this. It's down to creating money out of nothing and expecting more back. And it can't work. And that's, I, I, that's as difficult as I try and make it. Keep it really simple. And we are entirely... Because the other thing is, because the banks... The banks decide who gets money and who doesn't get money. Now, I'm sure that if we went along as a cooperative, we went to the bank and said, look, we've got this brilliant idea of having a community hub uh, right in the middle of Glastonbury. Can we have some money? And they go, not a chance. You know, because they decide where the money goes. So it's not always the best for the community. It's the best for the bankers. This is which is skewing everything that happens on the planet. Well, a lot of things are happening. And the current form of capitalism has no concept of right and wrong. It only recognises what is profitable and what you can get away with. And when you have the government, the media and the military and the police on your payroll, you can get away with pretty well anything. I think everyone would agree with that. Yeah. And there we go. We produce more than enough food to eradicate world hunger. Too bad there's not enough money to pay for it. And that is the, the thing. We should be living in abundance. 
we should be living in abundance. And the only reason why, it's not because we've got too much immigration, it's not because there's too many people on the planet, it's not because we can't grow the food, it's because money is created out of nothing and they charge interest on it and the banks and the government and the media are working together to extort us of our abundance. That's what I believe. So I'm looking at ways we can actually get round it. But just quickly, before uh, I, I go on, obviously you've got this crazy thing where, you, you, you know, they're just throwing money at the economy. That's the money supply of the balance sheet of the Bank of England. That's how much money they've created. Not worried about the figures. That's 2008. That's how much money has been created. The Second World War didn't even create a little bump. The first little bump was, uh, I think, the Suez Crisis in the late 50s when the oil started messing about. Uh, I think a lot of people actually believe... Well, hang on, I I'll, I'll, don't want to jump ahead too much. And this is something that Thomas Jefferson said, if the American people, but it goes for the British people as well, ever allow private banks to control the issue of money, first by inflation and then by deflation, the banks and the corporations that grow up around them will deprive the people of all their property until the children will wake up homeless on the continent their fathers con conquered. And you've got to realise that in America, yeah, Thomas Jefferson, uh, in America there are huge tented cities, so many, there's more empty property than, the, you know, there's literally so much empty property where the banks just want the property back purely because people can't pay their mortgage. And these people are now living in cars, living in tents, uh, and it's happening over here. There was a time, I used to work with homeless, I, I worked for a homeless charity for a while, and the only, when I was, this was only about five years ago, five, six years ago, and the only people that were homeless were basically people with substance misuse problems. Now, that's not the case. There's an awful lot of people who are just like us, that are no longer able to find anywhere because the government is no longer supporting them and, and not giving, you know, it's far more difficult to get benefits than it was even five years ago. So what they're doing, they're hitting the poorest, most disadvantaged in our society and at the end of the day, it's going right to the top and that's what we're having to live with. But what I'm going to be doing is looking at ways that we can actually bypass the current system and actually get to a point of abundance within the system. Because it's almost like if we can sort ourselves out, and because our reality around us reflects what we're doing internally, that's what I believe, uh, then if we can change ourselves from within and come from a point of abundance, then surely the rest of the universe will have to fall into line with that. It's like if you've got anger, a lot of anger in you, then you're going to find a lot of angry people around you. And when you can step out of that, or if you're in lack, uh, even though the system makes it a little bit more difficult to be abundant, uh, there are a lot of ways we can actually uh, bypass the system now. And has anyone actually looked at any of the, a few years ago, the LETS systems? Uh, has anyone used a LETS system? Local exchange. Yeah, yeah. Have you got something local in Glastonbury? There isn't one. Yeah, yeah. What? Right, right. Well, brilliant. Oh, that's good news. That's good news. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, I'm going to look at a couple of options because something else that's come across. The LET system is great, uh, but I think it's actually being overtaken by time banking. And time banking is uh, it's offering a little bit more than the standard LET system. What's LET stand for? Local Exchange Trading System. So it is it is effectively time banking. It's like but it's like a bank, a community bank, where you can come together as a community and say, if I paint your house, uh, because I'm pretty good with a paintbrush, that's not true actually, but if I was, uh, or you know, I was gonna do some work for you, and you're able to 
uh, cut my lawn, what we could do is once I work for you, then I've got some credit and then you can then put some credit in and we sort of balance it out. So it's like trading without money. So it's like a resource economy. It is, it is a resource economy, yeah, yeah. As is time banking, it's very similar. The time banking seems to be moving a bit more with the times and they've got some really good uh, resources on their website. I'm gonna be giving you the website addresses for all this sort of stuff as well. Now, something that, that economist Kenneth Boulding actually said was anyone who believes exponential growth, exponential is when it's going up and up and up and up and up and up, which it is, we saw that graph earlier. Anyone that believes exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world is either a madman or an economist. And this is true, they think that we can get 3% growth per annum. Well, we can't because 3% isn't a straight line because one year it's 3%, but the next year it has to be 3% on that 3%, and the next year it has to be 3% on that 3 So. 3% growth per annum, not that we've got growth at the moment, but this is this idea that we need more. This is what the banks say, you know, they need growth. Why do they need growth? Because they need money back to keep them going. This is because the whole system is out of balance. And it's a mathematical certainty that the economy will collapse. I'm sorry to break it to you, and, you know, but I think it could be wonderful for us because it's going to give us the opportunity to say, right, what else can we do? And I'm also hoping that it's not going to be too sudden or too painful. I know people with, th there was a time when I had shed loads of lentils, so probably three months worth of lentils, and because I thought it was going to be tough and difficult, I don't believe that now, uh, but I've still got a fair few lentils. It's always good to have lentils, isn't it? <laughs> even, if you, even if you eat meat, it's always good to have meat. But this is, this came out on this Saturday the 10th of, of January because I try and keep the sort of news stories up to date. Why the next stock market crash will happen any day now? And they've come up with five areas that they believe, because uh, has anyone noticed the, you know, if you do listen to the uh, corporate media, you realise that the, currently the, the actual oil price is plummeting at the moment. Uh, the first few days of this year, the stock prices have been going all over the place. And I only look at these things occasionally. I, I, I look at Zero Hedge. Has anyone come across that website? It's a good one, yeah. Because it's mostly investors, but they're sort of like, they're betting on the fact the whole system is going to go down. And they're talking about, you know, if you want to know, you know, what to do, buy gold, buy silver, whatever, you know, they give you some really important information. So it's looking... Now, I, I was one of the few people, it just happened that I was doing a talk about the imminent global financial meltdown back in 2008. And it was really because I've been doing these talks for ages since I found out all about this. And it was really funny that somebody, I actually had it, it was on film. And somebody said, when's it you think it's going gonna, it's gonna to go down? And I said, September. Why? Because every single crash always happens in the fall. Because there's all sorts of cycles going on here. And if you've ever studied, people have made themselves rich that understand astrology. Because when you understand astrology in the markets, you can link the two together. You realise that there are these natural cycles that are controlled by the planets. So it's like people have made a lot of money out of that. And uh, I know someone that, that's, that's done that. So it's quite remarkable. But anyway, I said September 2008. And the next time I saw these people, they go, my God, he saw it coming. <laughs> you know, it wasn't, it wasn't difficult. You know, all the signs were there. If you watch the news, you could see what's going on. Now, all the signs are looking like we're going to have a few problems. But I think it's, it's until we get the problem sorted out, it's like if, if you go to the doctor and you've got a problem with you and he gives you aspirin the whole time or paracetamol, yeah, it's going to take the pain away, but it's not going to deal with the problem. And in 2008, all they did was pump more money, give more money to the banks. They let one of the two of the little banks get eaten up by the big banks, but they haven't solved the systemic problems. And then when you've got people like George Soros, who sells all his shares in Citigroup and Bank of America and JP Morgan, Perhaps he knows something's going wrong. 
So, and these are big banks. These aren't even the ones that are going to have the bigger, you know, these companies are basically, they work with the City of London. And I personally think the City of London still controls the planet. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. So, but, same, you know, going back to Monopoly, at the end of the day, it all has to go back in the box, doesn't it? Because it's all a big game. It's all a big game. And, uh, you know, it, it can be a little bit more painful than Monopoly. It can be quite painful losing Monopoly. You know, I know this from experience. And it can also be painful when you lose all your money. But for me, it was a huge... I can never be really poor again in my life because if I lost everything again, I haven't got an awful lot, but I'm not scared of losing anything because I always know that if I stay in alignment, everything will work out perfectly. And that's nice to know. I, you know, last time... Can I ask you, just to interrupt you there? Yeah. The second time you talked about this stay in alignment thing... Yes. Be all right. Can you give us some more detail? Um, Only that if I get really greedy and grasp and sort of like... Yeah, if I was like in a business where I was trying to maximise profits and not do a really good... Uh, a mate of mine got got somebody to do a website for him and he ended up forking out three and a half thousand pounds in the end because they said oh we need this and we'll get you up to the top of google and they made all these promises at the end of the day he had a website he wasn't happy with now that company were just basically ringing him for every bit of money and offering him a bad service now ultimately they make might, might make a lot of money but long term it's not going to be good for them because they're going against the flow of the universe so we all know when we're in alignment when, you know, it's like, if you keep your palm open and a butterfly lands on it, if you think, oh, I'm going to hold on to this butterfly, and this happens in relationships as well, and you grasp and you hold on to it, immediately you crush the beauty of that butterfly. So it's a matter of keeping our palms open and giving and not sort of like, I want too much, and, and just taking a step back and allowing other people to go first. And for me, it's like, we know when we're in alignment, uh, but... When you actually put it, well, we actually say, well, what is alignment? I don't know, because it's like, uh, but I know for me, when I'm working, when I'm not thinking and I'm working from my heart, that's when I tend to be in alignment. Uh, what I would say is, to everyone, respect authority. Okay? Respect authority. And there's a few people going, what, what is he saying? What, you mean those guys in blue? No. There is only one authority in your life, and it's a very, very quiet voice, and you have to be very, very quiet to listen to it, but it comes through very powerfully, and it, it comes from here. And I'm sure that everyone that's in this room has heard that voice, and that's probably the nearest I'm going to get to like being in alignment. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. So, yeah, and the IMF actually did this sort of like, they got these uh, kids to do a thesis, I say kids, university graduates, to work out how can we solve the uh, IMF's debt problem. And they said, easy, we just create a promissory note. And I was actually going, in fact, I, I, every time I do a talk, I say, I've got to do a video. I'm going to phone up the British Treasury and say, oh, hello, uh, my name is John Whitrick from Get Out of Debt Free. Uh, is that the British Treasury? I say, yes. Uh, could you tell me what the current uh, debt is as of today? Now, they won't be able to give you a figure because it, I've actually got a little app on my phone and the last three digits are spinning around so fast you can't actually read them. That's how fast our debt is going up in this country uh, because it, it's, it's going exponentially. So uh, the debt is just growing so fast that the last three digits are a blur. Now, I'll say, well, look, what I'll do, I'll sort of like, I'll add a... I don't know, I'll add, say, like, 10 million, just to sort of, like, be on the safe side so that by the time it cashes, that it'll be... I, there's no reason why I can't create a promissory note, and this is something you can get off the website. We, we, you know, we give people the uh, background to do promissory notes because that's how... Uh, who was the guy? Uh, I've forgotten the name of the... Uh, it was a guy who actually said that promissory notes are as... Lord Denning, thank you. Who's that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Lord Denning said, I should have known that. Uh, Lord Denning actually said in a, you know, in a court case that promissory notes are to be treated as cash. Now, he didn't say bank 
created promissory notes, and every single uh, pound, every single ten pound, twenty pound note that we have, they are promissory notes. But what they've done, of course, they've taken away the promise to pay the bearer because it was a piece of paper that said, "I owe you the silver or the gold, whatever it was." It was initially it was silver. But of course they've taken that away, but we can still use promissory notes and people have used them successfully to pay off utility bills. Now I don't suggest everyone go out and pay their utility bills. Sometimes people are successful, sometimes they're not. Don't do anything without an awful lot of research, that's all I'm saying. Because you know, the, uh, the criminal cabal are very good at uh, getting us ending up in a lot of trouble. So let's look at the, you know, what I was going on to before. Uh, let's look at the alternatives and just thinking what money is it's a, a medium of exchange it's a unit of account and it's a way of storing value isn't it now if somebody else go on. I, I reckon the way we use money is as a token of gratitude mm -hmm. go, it is I it really is. like what you're giving me so yeah. I'm just going to give you something yeah I like that in fact I like that so much that I'm going to actually have to can you remind me at the end of the well, talk I'm to add that to the Token of gratitude, yeah. <laughs> and I have a token of gratitude. I actually have. <laughs> I actually have a TLC Earth Pound. I don't know what they what they're currently trading at. <laughs> I'm not giving it away though. <laughs> yeah. So, as I was saying earlier, though, there's the local exchange trading systems. Let's link UK, and. Uh, that's, uh, it's basically local community-based mutual aid networks and where they're working well, Top Nest, they're working really well. Uh, they've declined a little bit recently because I think time banking has been a little bit more uh, sort of on the ball. But where they are working, I think probably the best thing to do is find out what's the dominant system in your local area. You're going to find something. So whether it let, if let's, if everyone is already working with let's, then go with let's. If they're working with time banking, there's no point setting up a time banking thing locally if everyone, you know, see what the local people, and Glastonbury will have a low, I'm not from around here, so uh, I'm from way down in Dorset, so uh, I can't tell you what, what the, uh, is anyone aware of time banking around here? You have? Right. Right, I see, I see. So, yeah, time banking, they offer a lot of support. So, uh, and they're into sort of helping set up social enterprises. So it might be something that we could incorporate, you know, if we look at, you know, options within having a community based around here, that's something we could look at, perhaps. And... Uh, the Bristol Pound, yeah. I mean, the trouble with the Bristol Pound, it's still linked to the uh, pound sterling, isn't it? So, uh, but it's a way of still keeping the money within. I think the important thing to do is keeping local money in the local community. So rather than going to Tesco's or Morrison's, is try and get your money back to the local greengrocer or the local shop or whatever. Uh, obviously, the VAT. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I mean, the idea is you shouldn't end up with loads of tokens because they, sh ideally, they'll be moving the whole time. In a successful currency, there shouldn't be one person in India. But yeah, I can understand that. Obviously, if you can pay your your, your debt, your government debts with them, they're they're more use, and I appreciate that. So, and there there's the website, the time banking website. It's it's I can't I can't actually read that, but it, the total uh, there's over three thousand eight hundred organisations using time banking. So this is something that's really sort of seems to be growing. And, uh, and doing very, very well. Now, I was going to show you a video of it, 
but just from the time wise I'm sort of running a little bit over because I think we're coming up to six o'clock so what I'm going to do I just want to show you one little video but I've got a few video clips but what I suggest you do is if you're interested in uh, time banking get onto YouTube when you get home or tomorrow sometime and have a look there's some uh, very good clips uh, yes Yes. It completely messed up York banking, York City banking, because it was so strong and being used so within the city. Really? And this was time banking, was it? This was, well, they're we call it time banking now. Oh, let's, whatever, yeah, but an alternative local community. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I, I, I think the, it's almost like quite often the answers are right in front of us and we're sort of waiting for a sort of big leap forward or shifting consciousness. But what we do ourselves every day is really important. So I think, you know, what I'm trying to do is just fire up a little bit of, uh, you know, a, a few ideas really. And then of course you've got the digital currencies. Now, I could do... I could do a, a very long talk. No, I couldn't, but there are people that could, you know, Bitcoin. Uh, what I used to do is give you a potted history of Bitcoin, but now it's happened, you know, it's gone up, it crashed. The, when I started taking notice of Bitcoin was after it crashed and got back to about three quarters of where it was. And I thought, well, that's actually a proper currency because if it can crash, and people still have confidence in it, and the fact that the governments and banks are a little bit, well, they're shit scared of it, to be honest. Yeah, yeah totally, no, totally. No, you've got your own bank, your own computer, totally, no totally. No That's it. The, the important thing is it is decentralized. Yeah. Now, whereas PayPal, that's a you know, pretty well digital currency, but it's centralized. And if you fall out with PayPal, they can just take your money. And there are people that have fallen out and basically had their businesses taken away from them. And so it's quite frightening. PayPal are, <laughs> you fall out with them, they're nasty. They, they really are. Like any bank, you know, they, they haven't got a lot of compassion. But Bitcoin's interesting because it's like, the way you, it's, it's, there's no central computer. If, if you do some mining, what you're doing, you're effectively giving some of your computer power to backing up their system and it, it's very clever very clever one thing that we were looking at doing is getting a uh, get out a debt-free coin uh, we had some guys working on this uh, it's stalled at the moment but we're hoping that we can actually have our own if nothing else then just use it on the forum so that when somebody's uh, if somebody helps you out you give them a, a Bitcoin or whatever, and, and we give everyone a little bit of free currency when they join up or something, just as a way of sort of like, I don't know, just, just the good thing is the reason why this particular uh, guys were looking at get out of debt free to sort of like set this uh, cryptocurrency up is that we've got 60,000 members, and if we can engage them, then we've already, that's the way, it's engaging a lot of people with this one currency is a way that they could get their currency up and going quickly. Uh, it hasn't happened the first time, but I'm hoping this year. But there's another currency which I mentioned early. <laughs> do you recognise this one? Sorry. <laughs> you do. Uh, we haven't actually implemented it yet, and I don't know what the state of play is. Um, perhaps we can, uh, we can have a word, but uh, the original idea was to have tokens, and you know, I, I've got one of the few that are in existence, well, apparently there's a few hundred somewhere kicking around, but the idea is that when we go to festivals, rather than using uh, normal pound sterlings, we actually use our own tokens. And then the idea that unspent tokens are then invested in the land and pooled. And it's this coming together and working together, which is the idea. It comes up and up and up. And everyone here is saying yes. And they seem to be... Uh, like that idea. Now, I don't think there's anyone here that just wants to be escape and be richer than anyone else because that's still from a lack point of view. The reason why people become millionaires is uh, 
either because they're very good at what they do and just happen to earn loads of money, but a lot of them actually go out to get lots of money because it's a fear-based thing, because they need this buffer between themselves and reality. But if the system crashes and you can't get hold of your digital currency, then, you know, uh, you know the people that be really good are those that can forage and, you know, and uh, look after themselves. So you've got lots of different options. You've got Roger Hayes with his, uh, I know Roger, he's a, he's a really nice chap with his lawful bank. He's been talking about it for years and it's still not really up and running. So I really respect Roger and the work that he does. But if anything's going to be successful, it's going to work and it's going to happen. And it's like, if you have a good idea, things will flow and like Bitcoin, it's been hugely successful to a great extent, but it's not actually happened. So, you know, it seemed to, he was talking, saying all the right things, but as I say, the proof of the pudding, I think, is, uh, is what it's about. Now, Positive Money, who's come across these group? Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm impressed with their videos and all the things. They say all the right things and their videos are really well produced. They seem to have lots of money because they've got really nice offices in London and they've got press secretaries and they're like, and so I started sort of looking into it and they're talking about taking away money creation from private banks. Brilliant, I thought, yeah. And giving it to the Bank of England. What? You know, Bank of England is a privately owned bank. Uh, it's not part of the government. It's totally separate from the government and it is owned by, the, basically, there's a whole board of directors. Now, giving the money creation to the Bank of England is like giving the keys to the hen house to the biggest fox. I, I personally think, I personally think, and this is my own point of view, you might not agree with me. If so, that's fine. We can have a chat about it in the bar afterwards. I personally think that they are controlled opposition. I really do. Uh, they, you know, they, they sort the problem out, but giving it to the Bank of England, no, no, please no, no. There's no reason why the Bank of England should ever have to create money, because the government should be creating it. Uh, and I believe that very strongly. And there's a big difference. The Bank of England is not the government. It is totally separate. And the other thing is the Bank of England, just like the Federal Reserve, has never been audited. We never see what's going on. They do everything behind closed doors. So, uh, oh dear, I was getting a little bit angry there, wasn't I? Let's take a deep breath now and get a bit of zen. Yes, nothing to do with the government, apart from the fact that they create. Why is it we have to pay interest on, on the money? What, the, the government should be able, and it has done. It has done. And I tell you when it, when it has done, it did do after the First World War. And this chap, Justin Walker, another chap that I've had the uh, privilege to meet, his uncle, he, he, he's, uh, he's quite connected sort of in his lineage because his uncle was actually involved with setting up the Bilderberg Group. And I'm sure a few of you in this room have heard about the Bilderberg Group. So uh, you were there, were you? Yeah, I was. Excellent, excellent. So... Uh, the Bradbury Pound was, after 1914, after the First World War, uh, the government was pretty well bankrupt, as, you know, that's what wars do. They tend to bankrupt governments. Even the, com the government that wins ends up bankrupt. The only people that win in wars are the bankers. That's why we have wars. Now, they, they, they were in a situation where we couldn't actually... <coughs> the government couldn't pay for anything, so it had to create its own debt-free money. And, and, and they can do it. So this, is, this, this can be done. And this is it. It's a Bradbury pound, a one pound of Great Britain and Ireland. And it was debt-free and used until 1914. Now, what Justin did, his uncle actually told him about the Bradbury pound. Because I think he actually felt a bit of guilt about setting up the Bilderberg group, this secret group which is supposed to run the planet. Which, and I think it probably does. Uh, but, and it's the equivalent of the US greenback. So different countries have, have been able to create their own debt-free money. And this is money that doesn't come with debt or interest. This is created. And something... Oh. Uh, they could pay their taxes. What, what about the Bradbury Pound? Did they pay taxes? Yes. Presumably, yes. they pay their taxes. 
Yes, you could. Yes, it was. It was no. There was no limitation on it. Yeah. Yes. 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 Well, I don't know about paying money to. I, I've personally chosen not to pay HMRC, but uh, so that's just a personal. Off, just the that they are I personally think that income tax is yeah. just paying off debt to private yeah. banks. That's my own personal belief. It's very difficult to see where it goes, but that's what I. Yeah, that's what I'm to led to believe. Yes, so I, I quite agree. Right, yes, yeah. If they don't reply to you, certainly. You've got a contract law. You can say to the court of law and say, I'm exempt, exempt yeah. from paying taxes. What, what I did, contract. I just became completely invisible. So yeah. what I did, I, I just lived in a, in a caravan in the woods for a year, off grid, and so that I wasn't on the system. And where I live now, I'm not sort of, I'm half on, half off. So I've got a bank account, I've got a legal car. Uh, in as far as I have, you know, I, I pay the things that they extort out of you, uh, so that when the police stop me, I can get away relatively quickly. But I don't pay, and I'll, I'll, this is probably going on YouTube. I don't pay income tax. I don't pay council tax. Uh, yeah, you know, because I, if you find, show me the law that says I've got to pay income tax and council tax, I'll pay it. But if you look at the wor work that Cy Spaniard has done. When he, it's brilliant, uh, do look it up on YouTube. Cy Spaniard, White Rabbit, uh, HMRC, you'll probably find it without any problem. And he actually phones up one of the experts on law at HMRC and actually starts nailing them down. And the guy got really angry. He said, well, well, well it's in there somewhere. Uh, uh, he said, well, yes. Why? And, and Cy Spaniard, what he did, he said that he went to the pub and this guy in the pub had a really convincing argument that he didn't have to pay income tax. It was nothing in law. And when he actually started pressing this guy's buttons, this guy got really defensive. He said, no, 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 look, I agree with you. I know we have to pay tax. I just want the proof to tell my mate. He did it. Brilliant. Brilliant. There's no law that says we're going to pay income tax. There can't be. Yes, you can, and yeah. The very start of it, you, had, you ever run a business and refused to pay VAT? No. Oh, right, okay. When I was running my business, I paid VAT. Oh, right. But what happened, I sold my business, ended up in a huge amount of debt, contacted all these people, said, I can't pay, I haven't got any money, but somehow the debts went away. That's what I'm saying. Do you know anyone who has run a business and refused to pay VAT? I don't, personally. I don't, personally. I think you would... That would be difficult, very difficult. Uh, that, saying that, I have to have a think. I'm sure there are, there are people, there are people. I don't know, I don't know. But what I'll do, I'll, I'll do it, I'll sort of like take questions from the floor at the end. The main reason for that, I'm deaf in one ear and I struggle to hear what the questions that are being asked. So Guernsey Expert, I'm from Guernsey, uh, originally born in Guernsey, so I found out about this, and this was after the Napoleonic War, so this was before the Bradbury Pound. Same thing again, we'd had a war with the French, now I personally think Napoleon and Hitler, for that matter, were anti the European bankers, and I know Napoleon certainly was. Uh, because he, he said as much, and he was actually trying to get France out of this sort of banking system. That's why he was like, this war, I believe this is, war was about money as much as land. So Probably both. Gaddafi. Sorry? So was well, yeah, that, very true, very true. In fact, everyone on the axis of evil isn't in the IMF. So you look at the countries that aren't in the IMF, that haven't, the only country that's no longer in the IMF that's not actually on the uh, axis of evil is Iceland. And they're doing very nicely, so now they've broken free of the banking system. But anyway, I think I'm taking too long, uh, you know, I'm running over, so I'm gonna have to speed up a little bit. But the Guernsey experiment was a situation where the island was bankrupted by this long drawn out war with the French, and they just happened, although they were close to France, they happened to be English by that time, they were French, but England had actually colonized the, uh, the island, and they decided to create their own debt-free money. And the only thing that stopped it was a few years later, the banks got onto the Privy Council and the royal family actually got onto the 
basically the bailiff because it was controlled under the crown and they put a stop to it. And I personally think they bribed the local politicians to put a stop to it because it all have stopped. And the island is still prosperous now as a result because they built a harbour that was 200 years ahead of... It didn't actually have to be expanded until the 80s when suddenly they wanted a marina and things like that. It, it's remarkable. It was built hundreds of years ago. They built this huge harbour. They built sea walls to stop the sea the water coming in. They built markets. They built all their infrastructure because they, all they didn't have was they had labour and had loads of granite. It's just they couldn't build anything because they didn't have any money to pay everyone. So the idea that we have... Every time you hear, oh, we, we, you know, we're going to have to reduce this and reduce that because there's not enough money. Know that it's not, it's, you know, that is the manufactured lack. It's not that we haven't got enough money, it's that the current system steals our wealth from us and that our natural, our natural state would be abundance. I think we'd all be able to work two days a week at something we love doing and spend the rest of the time making music, coming together as community, actually doing things we love. And in fact, you know, we, we will, and we will, and that's what we're, thank you, and that's what we're aiming for. That's what we're aiming for. So, what are we doing you now? What can be done at the moment? Now, th this whole open source thing is really exciting. Uh, if anyone, who runs Firefox as a browser? Good, good, there's a few people in the room. So if you're running Firefox as a browser, that piece of software was actually made by hundreds of people, probably thousands of people all over the world, coming together with an idea that they wanted to make a browser that was better than Internet Explorer, and they did it. And most of them are getting no money at all out of it. Some people make a little bit of money by offering extras, like called plugins, which some of them you pay for, but the majority of people are coming together and working for nothing. And those old hippies in the room that are my age or older might even remember the Grateful Dead. Now, they were doing the same thing because years ago, what they were doing is, if you turned up at one of their gigs, you could take your, you know, it was when cassette recorders first came out, and you could actually bootleg a, uh, you know, a gig. And so you could actually, and they actually encouraged people, most people, most uh, record companies didn't want you because they wanted you to buy the vinyl which was what it was uh, back then, but you could actually take your reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder or the cassette recorders that were like, coming in at the time and actually record them. So they, the idea is that you could, they'd share their music for nothing, and as a result, they actually got really well-known much quicker than had they actually sell their music. And this is interesting because nowadays, this is happening again, isn't it? Because now there's an awful lot more, because of this file sharing online, a lot more bands are sharing some or all of their music first before you actually buy it. And, you know, you're seeing some big, I think it's, uh, some big bands actually giving, I think Elbow and bands like that have been giving away. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's a different way of doing things. It's giving first. Because I think when you give, you create a vacuum which allows you to sort of like, it might be a long-term strategy rather than a short-term strategy. And most record companies wouldn't want you to do it. But now we've actually got open source hardware. And you've got this OSHWA, Open Source Hardware Association. And this is a little synthesizer, because I like messing about with music and computers occasionally. And this is a little synthesizer. I've actually bought the circuit boards for this. Now, this company is called Mutable Instruments, and they create synthesizers. But un unlike Moog and Roland and people like that, they offer everything. They, they, they show you their circuit boards. You can go and get a circuit board made and go and buy the parts, or you can just buy the circuit board, or you can get somebody to build one for you but it's basically all open source. So the programming, the hardware, the software, they give it to you all. And as a result, they're really, you know, it's huge. There's whole forums just talking about these, these, these things. And so it's a different way of doing business. Another thing, there's a, I was gonna show you a video, but as I say, I'm running a little bit over on time. Another thing is this hexa yurt. Anyone come across this? A really simple yurt idea building a yurt from flat panels, either waterproof cardboard or uh, plywood or whatever. But somebody came up with this brilliant idea, really simple. And 
of course, they don't know how many, because they don't sell them. You can just download them. They had to work out how many there are. Now, there's some, there's some pictures of, those are hexayurts that are made up. Now, they've been using them in the third world for emergency uh, accommodation. Uh, and they also use them at festivals, just like we use yurts as well. Now, does anyone recognize that? Uh, Burning Man. Burning Man, yeah. Now, <laughs> why is it we can't actually <laughs> do this when we get festivals together? Well, I suppose we haven't got a flat desert. That's one reason. But it, you must admit, it is pretty impressive, isn't it? Seeing as they're all hippies as well. But, uh, I mean, it's quite remarkable. <laughs> but what they did to find out how many of these hexa yurts there were, they actually did, from that satellite, they zoomed in and actually counted the hexa yurts. Because of the shape of them, they could tell what were normal yurts and what were hexa yurts. And there was over a thousand of these things. So that was somewhere, somebody come up with the idea, put it on the internet, given it away for free, and now, you know, people, you can buy a hexa yurt or you can just, like, do it for free. But they counted over a thousand, and that was back in 2012, so there's probably way more. And also, something that I'm sure a lot of people recognise these things, 3D printers. You've now got 3D printers that can now print 3D printers. Almost. I mean, it's like, they can't do the electronics, but they can print a lot of the main, you know, the main, uh, certainly the plastic, uh, uh, a, a lot of the sort of in infrastructure and the main sort of parts of it. But the great thing is, if you have one of these in your community and you need a specific, a, a specific part, you get it made. And so, you, you know, it's still in its infancy. Can you remember when printers first came out? They were quite expensive and slow and, uh, well, the ink still is expensive. But it's, it's, it's exciting because it's decentralising. And then just looking at different models for a, uh, you know, a spiritual community, there'll be lots of people come up with some brilliant ideas. Uh, I can show you my favourites, but I'm just going to shoot through these uh, these few, and then I'm going to play a short video because uh, uh, I think I, yeah, I'm, I, otherwise I'm going to be running a little bit over time. We want a little bit of time for the round table. So models for a spiritual community. Did everyone see Zeitgeist? Yeah, I think everyone saw. So you saw these wonderful things from the Venus Project. Yeah. Uh, a mate of mine, Dave Murphy, actually went out and met uh, this chap, uh, Jacques Fresco. Uh, he was quite surprised that, although he had all these brilliant ideas, that they, they were still on the grid. He was expecting, like, solar panels and windmills, and, and he was uh, like, a little bit... He's got all these brilliant ideas, but he's like, they're not putting them into practice. So he was like... And I don't know about you, but... My idea of utopia isn't that. I wouldn't mind going there for a weekend, just see what it's like, and have a go on the boat. But for me, I want to be a little bit grounded. Give me a hexa year or a proper year and put me in the woods. I'm, I'm going to be a lot happier. That's, you know, that's why I like the festivals, because it gives you a chance to like, take your shoes off and walk around bare feet and actually connect. I, I think that what we do has to be real strong connection to the earth. That's what I personally feel. And I love the ideas of these things, but I think it looks more like something that Jerry Anderson sort of like came up with. But uh, so, you know, there's a little bit of green there, isn't there? But it's like, it's, it still looks like dominating. And it's also the idea of, that he's talking about using computers to make decisions when, you know, and this resource thing. It scares me. I don't know. It's, it's a bit, I find it a bit Orwellian. Perhaps that's just me and my... Uh, what I think. But there's a couple of books and a, a bit of work that I've sort of looked into. Eric Butterworth, uh, he's got this idea, he's got his lovely book on uh, spiritual economics. They're all very similar, going towards a gifting economy. Another one is Dahas Vera Das. Uh, he's another one who's coming from like a Buddhist approach to it. Uh, oh, sorry, no, he's, uh, he's actually, uh, you yeah, know, of... of uh, Krishna, but uh, it's basically coming into alignment. By, well, it's the same thing with coming together as community, uh, rather, you know, and that's what we have to do. We have to do this. This idea that we're all separate, just because we've got separate bodies and we have, you know, we live in separate places, we're going to realise that we are one organism when we start acting like that. It's, you know, it's this idea of manufactured lack has separated us, and we've really got to uh, bring it back together. Eileen Workman's done a lovely book as well, Currency of Life. 
My favourite, I must say, is Charles Eisenstein. Uh, he was actually over here last year. I missed him, unfortunately. He was only about 100 miles away from me. He was down in the West Country. Uh, it, do buy the book. It is very good. You can download it for free on the internet and just make a donation. I would say buy it because it's nice. It's such a lovely book as well. Uh, it's just, if, if you're interested in this thing. He talks about money in the mind, the fact that we've got a lot of prejudice around money because of the way it's made. And once actually, but we, which is unfair really, because money isn't the problem. The problem is not money. The problem is the current system of money. I haven't got a problem with money. I'd like lots of it. But I wouldn't be happy being a millionaire knowing that there are other people not being able to feed themselves. So if everyone can be a millionaire, I will be happy being a millionaire. So let's get the, let's get, let's, we, you know, and that's what we will have. We will have that. We will be able to do what we want to do when we want to do it. And we won't have to think, can I afford to do it? Because that's where we're going. That's definitely where we're going. And this idea of property, everyone has their own lawnmower, everyone has their own cars, everyone has this and that, and it's like crazy that we don't have like one lawnmower for a street and we just take turns to use it. You know, we've got this idea, oh, I've got to have mine, well, that's mine. Oh, can I borrow it? No. <laughs> yes, sir. Totally, so totally. It's it's fear based. And, and you talking about all your lentils, whatever. Yeah, I yeah. Think exactly the same yeah, thing yeah. As yeah. Before, where I yeah. Suddenly, I thought, oh my god, we really are hitting that. Yeah. And so it makes us hoard. Yes, yes, it does. And it does. It does. Fear based. Fear based. Yeah. Well, that's very true. Very true. But when we care when we come from a point of caring then we will care about uh, you know the community and we'll care about things perhaps so and this idea of scarcity it's like it's manufactured it is manufactured it's the whole you know go back to this this is how i explain it because it's simple and you just get the idea that you can't get 11 marbles back this is the whole point yeah Yes. And, and, and in that headspace, in that fear-based uh, head set, then you feel like you need to accumulate and hoard. Totally. Greed is totally. kind of a, a reaction to the yes. scarcity. Yes, it is. When you're coming from abundance, things like totally. greed, totally. hoarding, are, are relevant. Yeah, I no totally agree with you. That, you know, the, the sense of greed just dissipates. Yeah. Because everything's abundant. Why, what, what, it's, it's a nonsense. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. Right, I'm going to move on because I'm getting to the end of the talk now and I want to, like, uh, don't want to hold up the round table. Transitioning to a gift economy. Now, a gift economy is based on one simple thing, and that is gratitude. And the way you actually invest in a gift economy is by giving things to other people. Because then you've got... You, you, you know, you've got gratitude. I came here today, somebody lent me their car so I could get here today because mine uh, needs a new clutch and I'm going to have to get underneath it at some time and putting it off. But it's like the fact that I can borrow something because I've got credit with that person because he knows that I'm not going to trash his car and he knows that I'm going to do like, something for him. So that's what credit is really. It's not creating something out of nothing. You get credit is if... If you haven't got anywhere to live, somebody will put you up for a few days. You know, so, oh, look, no, I'm a bit down on my luck. You know, can I sit on your sofa? Yeah, no problems. Oh, you're out within a few days. <laughs> that's fine. So, you know, that's what real true credit is. And you see that a, a greed economy is everyone's fighting for the, you know, for the, everyone's after that 11th marble. Whereas a gift economy, everyone is just interrelating and, and because that's, you know, we're coming together. Yeah. And, and, uh, I haven't got time to go on to the Ubuntu thing, but so this is, this is what you can take home with you tonight. Uh, write it, put it on a piece of paper, put it under your pillow so you can like go into your mind every night. I know you're working with an abundance of like program that, uh, and thanks very much for sharing that with me. It's very interesting. But the thing is, we, you know, we can attract abundance by being open to it. And as I say, abundance is a lot more than money. It, it's community, it's sharing, it's everything else. So, 
Basically, uh, this is something that the OPPT actually said uh, a little while ago. Uh, one uh, people, uh, this, uh, oh, I can't remember what it was called. But anyway, in the months to come, our world is going through change beyond recognition. Our true history will be revealed along with the truth of the systems that we've been living under. Much technology that's been withheld from us will be released, including power production, health and transport. War, disease and pollution will be a thing of the past. And I really feel that we are going towards that. It's not just a few hippies in Glastonbury that are waking up. It's everyone on the planet. It's just that some of us have woken up a little bit faster than others. And so those of us, it's to, uh, up to us to actually spread the love and let go of the fear. So, and the important thing is the person that says it can't be done shouldn't interrupt those people that are doing it. Okay? And the time is now. And the new globe, oh yeah, there will be challenges. The powers that be may be powerful with their media, money, and armed thugs. But we are infinitely more powerful. And it's time to step into that power now. And what the caterpillar calls the end of the world, the master calls the butterfly. There's our butterfly. And the new global currency is love. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was great. That was really good fun. Thank you for being a really lovely bunch of people. And it just feels like I'm doing this to my family, except my family think I'm completely mad. Um, this feels a lot more like my family than my family do. So thank you for being part of my family. Really appreciate that. <laughs>